Nice to meet you all. My name is Jordan. Um, I'm one of the founders of Compound. Uh, today, I'm very excited uh, to chat with you about my hatred of personal finance. So I hate finance more or as much as most people, perhaps. Um, you know, many years ago when I started the company, um, you know, I just wanted to build something fun and impactful and kind of work with my friends. Meanwhile, I was being thrown all of these acronyms, these like fancy words that I didn't understand. Um, and my friends convinced me to write this blog post all about equity compensation. So I wrote this essay that kind of like mapped out what these different acronyms meant. I went from like reading engineering code to reading the tax code. I published it on Hacker News on the internet. Lots of people came to me with all of these like complicated, boring adult tasks. They were like, help me. I was like, well, certainly there's someone else out in there in the world who you could go get help with. That's like a real adult professional. I went and tried to meet those people. They were trying to sell me golfing. They were sending me LinkedIn messages. I was like, certainly there's a better way to do this. That's why we built Compound. We're a wealth manager specifically designed for tech people. We work with clients across many of the best companies in the world, and we're super excited to help them manage their money, file their taxes, borrow money, track their assets. Today, we're talking about perhaps my favorite topic in the world, uh, which is equity compensation. Um, and um, I was super lucky to be able to bring on someone that I really admire who has gone through you know, both the ups and downs of different startups and you know, equity has become a big part of their life, which is um, really, really powerful. Um, so I'm very excited to, to be working with Christina here today. Uh, Christina, it'd be helpful maybe if you give a quick introduction of yourself, and then we'll dive into the kind of agenda for today. Sure. So um, I joined First Round Capital earlier this year, but uh, the 12 years prior to that, I've basically been working in startup after startup. So most recently, I was at Notion, leading our platform and partnerships teams. Um, and then before that, I was at Stripe, uh, leading a new business unit. And I joined Stripe in, in 20. 12 when it was quite small. Um, and then two small startups before that. So uh, broadly, uh, yeah, have just spent a lot of time in startups and uh, yeah, have been have been very pleased personally with the outcome of my startup equity. And I think um, if people learn a lot more about it, I think they can be far more educated in terms of the decisions that they make. Totally. Um, and, and thank you again for spending the time here. Um, Christina, like I said, is someone I've learned a lot from, um, and uh, I, would, I think all of you would, would be able to as well. I'm um, also, you know, you can hear me say this stuff's important and that will only go so far, but Christina is perhaps living proof that, you know, thinking about this stuff uh, can make a really big difference towards your long-term future. So my goals for today to kind of make them as explicit as possible, um, you know, Christina spent a long time at Stripe. So I like to say that we are trying to increase the GDP of everyone on this call. Right? So we want to make sure that you know everyone on this call walks away a bit smarter. First and foremost, I want to make sure you care about your equity. Um, and uh, by being on this call, you're already most of the way there. So thank you for, for doing that. And you should thank yourself because you're doing an adult grown-up thing today by taking control of your finances. The second thing is I want to make sure that you walk away with kind of an understanding of some of the key terms, you know, some of those acronyms that you know may scare you, um, that alphabet soup of different words that, that you may not understand regarding joining a company or leaving a company, really everything you have to know kind of in between. And then the third part is, you know, I want to apply this in the real world and, you know, spend some time with Christina and Max is also on our team, just walking through like, okay, if you're in this position, what are the types of things to think about? Um, and how do I actually apply it to my life? Um, and if you have questions, um, feel free to leave them in the chat. I have a note written over here to talk slower, so I'm going to be trying to do that, but I'm, I just love equity and taxes so much that I sometimes talk too fast, so feel free to bother me. Um, it's not bothering. It's helpful feedback. Um, so no, we, we move fairly quickly here. No long intros, I promise. Uh, number one, get you to care. So we, luckily at Compound, have helped people save millions of dollars. The way we've done this is by helping people really navigate the world of acronyms here and for what it's worth to make sure you fully care, you know, you can save 20 to 40% of the value of your equity um, just by paying attention for the next 15 to 20 minutes, right? So it's it's a very high ROI activity. Um, there's lots of TikToks that you could be watching right now. There's lots of other things that you could be doing. But if you just focus the next 15, 20 minutes, I really think we can increase your odds of success in the future. It's almost like Y Combinator for people. Perhaps, you know, we can make your, you more likely to succeed in the future. So broadly speaking, when you get an offer letter, right, um, or you're sitting at your company today, there's kind of three components from a compensation perspective. There's cash, there's benefits, and then there's this thing called equity. Um, and equity is one of those things when you're reviewing the contract that you ask yourself, like, is this a lottery ticket? And like, what could it be in the future? Um, and 
if you're anything like me and when you see this offer letter and you're like, I own a thousand options in this company, if you're anything you're like me, you're like, well, what does a thousand options mean, right? A thousand options of what? Like, what are they worth? How do I get them? What are the tax implications, et cetera? So what we're going to do over the next about five, 10 minutes is cover all the finance tax stuff you have to know. And Max will drop in a link to a blog post we have about this as well. So if you like reading better, if you really like this stuff, you can send me an email, jordan at withcompound.com. We can talk about it all the time. Um, but we'll cover all of these key ingredients so that you can feel fully informed when you're kind of looking at an offer letter um, or you're looking at your kind of current company. But I have to give one really quick disclaimer, which is that tax lawyers don't rule the world. So there are things you can do and you can become an expert at all of this stuff. And you will in the next five to 10 minutes. But at the end of the day, choosing your personal return on investment for your life is far more impactful than being a tax wizard often. Um, and what I mean by that is choosing where to work, and we'll dive into this with, with Christina a little bit later, you know, is not just a function of like what type of stock option you have, right? You can think a lot about who you're working with, what you're working on, you know, do you enjoy that sort of thing, you know, uh, where you live, like the work, the culture, all of these things are really key ingredients. And of course, there is this power law dynamic in startups where choosing the right company is also financially very, very valuable beyond all that. So we'll dive into some of um, like the other factors beyond the financial minutia in a second. Um, but I want to make sure that you leave with at least a key understanding of kind of how startup equity works. So ramble aside, here's what you need to know. High level, when you join a private company, right, and you're offered compensation in that company, the cash is fairly easy to grok and easy to understand. But when you get equity, you have to realize that private companies don't have public valuations. So for private companies, instead, we often use two other types of valuations. When an when a, um, investor invests in a company, they get the preferred price, right? That, private, that, that preferred valuation, let's call it $100 million. Um, that's what investors pay for when they invest in your stock. When investors invest in your company, they get also preferred stock. So it has preferential treatment. So for instance, if the company were to be acquired, they get paid back before the second type of stock, which is called common stock, right? So investors get preferred stock. That's the first thing you have to know. The second thing you have to know is there's a second type of valuation, and that's called the 409A valuation or the fair market value. I mean, the 409A valuation is a lot less than the preferred valuation. Like when you're a private company, it can sometimes be like 20 to 30% of the preferred valuation. Um, and the reason that matters is twofold. One, hopefully over time, your preferred valuation rises and, uh, sorry, your foreign and a valuation rises to, to mirror your preferred valuation. So when the company goes public, there's just one valuation, right? That's the public stock price. But while you're private, you have two valuations. You have the preferred valuation and you have the 409A valuation. Why this matters is because the way stock options work and the way equity works um, is that you care about the 409A for tax purposes. So that 409A number matters a lot. Um, but that 409A value is how you value shares. And when you join a company, you're often issued stock options. Stock options give you the right to purchase shares. So they're not shares, right? You're not a shareholder when you own stock options. You own the right to purchase shares and you unlock the right to purchase shares over time, right? You unlock the right to exercise your options, it's called, when you buy them um, over time through a process called vesting. So you often will get a vesting schedule, call it four years with a one-year cliff, meaning you wait one year before you start unlocking the right to purchase, and then they vest you know, over time, so you continue the right to, uh, to purchase them. And the price you can pay is called the strike price, right? So you exercise, your, you, know, you, you, um, you get the right to purchase them at the strike price, which is a fixed price that remains static you know, you're, for, your, for as long as you're at the company, um, as long as you own the options, and you're able to kind of purchase them for the strike price. Now, the way this all connects is that the strike price when you join a company is equal to the 409A at the time of the issuance, right? So that 409A valuation is important because that's how you set your strike price. And the hope, the optimistic view is when you're looking at your company is that the 409A will continue to rise, right? That share price will continue to rise and the strike price will remain constant, right? Be well, it will remain constant because it is a fixed price. So the delta between those things is called the bargain element. Right, that delta, the spread between the strike price and the latest valuation is known as the bargain element. And that is a good thing, right? That is the whole mechanic here. You can buy low. In theory, you can sell high in the future. The problem is that it's only in theory because it's an illiquid private thing. So if you work at a tech company that's private, you can't just sell it, right? Um, it's not liquid. So you have to think about the timing of this investment opportunity. That's, that's kind of one, one variable. The second is that you may owe taxes at the time of exercising before you have any liquidity, 
right? So you may buy low, but you can't sell high. And the way the way the world works today with the government is that you will actually owe taxes on the bargain element before you actually sell. So if you have something called a non-qualified stock option or an NSO, if you have if you have one of those, um, you will owe taxes on the difference between the strike price, so the strike price, which is the foreign NA at the time you were issued the option, um, in the latest foreign NA valuation. On that spread, you owe immediate ordinary income taxes at the time of exercising. If you have something called an ISO, another type of option, incentive stock option, you don't owe ordinary income tax, but you owe another acronym. You owe something called the alternative minimum tax, or AMT, which is a totally separate calculation. And at Compound, we built calculators to kind of automatically calculate all this stuff for you. But the high level you need to understand is that when you exercise, you may be taxed on the delta between the strike price and the latest foreign NA valuation. That bargain element may be taxable. You're also going to be taxed, though, on the time between you, you acquiring the share and the time you sell it. And the idea here is that if you can make that holding period, it's called, greater than one year, you'll most likely qualify for long-term capital gains. But if you make that holding period less than one year, for instance, if you exercise your options and then you immediately sell them, for instance, at an IPO or into a tender offer, one of those events, um, you'll owe ordinary income tax on the gain, right? So that delta, that, that difference, um, you know, may, uh, you know is, is why you may be incentivized to exercise some of your options earlier. There's a lot of other considerations. So I suggest reading a lot about this, working with a professional, but very high level, that's how the mechanic works. So you're at a company, you have a fixed strike price, the foreign NA is kind of growing um, and uh, you have a bargain element, a spread, the option is valuable, so congratulations, but you may owe taxes at the time of exercising. So you have to, you have to think about that. The other thing you have to think about as things kind of scale is this word called dilution. A lot of you know, employees are really upset you know, as, a, as a founder of a company Sometimes you know we raise we raise money and people come to me and they're like, oh my goodness, I'm diluted all this and I'm and I thought I was doing my job. Right? I thought I was like doing my job going to fundraise to effectively sell equity to our to investors so that we could kind of get capital to increase our odds of success. But as an employee, it may feel sad when you have this kind of percentage ownership of the company, right? You have you know options or shares and you know percentage ownership of the company and that number might go down over time as the company continues to fundraise. But we have to often realize is that looking at percentage ownership is only one variable. The other thing you can look at is value or potential value. And kind of being value aligned with the company is a way to kind of think about your overall return on investment calculation. And that is really the kind of goal of all of this sort of math, which I'm happy to dive into. If people want to leave questions, we can kind of answer a lot of specifics on how all that's calculated soon. But what you're really calculating is, is effectively a return on investment, um, you know, an ROI. And, you know, Beyond money, you also could have an ROI on fun and learning and impact and prestige and network and skills and all of these other things. But money, you know, when you're when you're calculating the ROI there, it's just an investment opportunity. Um, and when you're thinking about accepting a startup offer, you know, you want to do this sort of analysis. And your job is actually quite similar to a venture capitalist job, right? A professional investor's job, although you have one life, they get to diversify. You have you, maybe your friends. They have a team of analysts that are underwriting the opportunity. And also, they're not going to be waking up all day, every day, thinking about how to make the stock valuable. They're just giving their money and often kind of walking away slightly. So that is the kind of job to be done. And Christina, maybe it can be helpful in hindsight to think through this, but I'm curious if we were to go back, not too far, but you were quite early at Stripe. I'm curious, like when you were going through the offer of thinking about, am I going to invest my life in working on this company? How, how did you process it then? And like, what do you wish you could tell yourself in hindsight? So how did I go through the process ultimately of like deciding whether I should take this offer? So broadly, I would say that with Stripe, the offer had like a lower salary component compared to my last startup. So you know, the vast majority of people at Stripe made the same salary and there wasn't like much negotiating allowed as a result of that. Um, so I wanted to better understand the equity component, knowing that that was the vast majority of how I was going to be compensated. And I knew the basic terminology from my last startup, which I was at prior to Stripe. Um, and basically what I did was put together a spreadsheet to kind of better understand, uh, the Stripe opportunity. So specifically when I thought about it, 
um, I wanted to say, hey, let's put together all of the numbers so I can understand here is the compensation from my prior opportunity and here's the Stripe offer, right? So first you start with the really basic things. It's like salary, salary plus bonus, and then the equity gross value. So like what is the uh, number of shares that are in my offer um, multiplied by the preferred price of um, those shares. And so the preferred price is effectively whoever the last investor was, what price did they pay per share for that company? Um, and that is the equity gross value. So uh, then I'm trying to better understand what is the exercise cost. So how much will I be paying for these shares uh, or for these options? And um, in that case, um, you would get the exercise cost. So you know that's obviously value that you're putting in um, to the company. Um, and then I basically calculate the, the net equity value at the most recent preferred price. So basically subtract the exercise cost from the gross value. And that is the like real value of what I would be getting today at the value of the company uh, valued today um, in this particular offer. Um, and then I have a line that's basically like, what would my comp be over the next four years um, at my kind of most recent preferred price for Stripe? And then how would I compare that to the other company, right? Um, and I would say at pretty much every company I've ever joined, um, the new company I'm joining, the offer is pretty much always lower <laughs> than the previous company. Um, and often that is just because um, I've often left, you know, slightly larger companies and then gone smaller and smaller and smaller. And so um, often those companies, you know, don't look as good from an equity perspective. But I do think the thing that that is basically like what percentage of the of the company I have. And that I hope with every company I join continues to go up. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in my spreadsheet, I uh, also include, for example, uh, the 409A price of the, of the share, the um, fully diluted share count. So like how many shares out there exist in the world for this particular company. And then like, you know, divide the shares by um, ultimately how many shares the company has in total. And that's like the percentage. So if I were joining as a first 10 employee and someone was giving me like 0.01% of the company, I'd say, hmm, that like feels a little strange. That's like not what I would expect for how much risk um, I'm ultimately taking um, for this particular opportunity. So um, yeah, broadly, like those are the things that I looked at from an equity component to understand the offer. Um, I also think there's plenty of things that you can ask to kind of understand the company um, and like what state the company is in. Um, but I, I would just say like, you know, I think I did all the basic things, which are like Google, like, you know, how does equity at startups work? Um, but obviously Compound has really great materials now that didn't exist then, um, which I think basically have all of this information. Yeah. Um, and I think that I better want to, I, I basically wanted to understand a number of other questions um, that where, where the answers didn't necessarily affect my decision to join the company. So for example, um, was the uh were the was the equity i was receiving like qsbs eligible which is like nice to have from a tax treatment perspective but like if the company isn't eligible for that it's not necessarily going to change my decision on whether or not to join so there are plenty of those questions as well makes a ton of sense so maybe to play it back you know i, I think now you you know you invest in companies professionally but perhaps back then you know when you were choosing where to work Back then, perhaps it, it sounds like you know you wanted to make sure you understood the offer first and foremost. And what's sometimes awkward for an employee and, and Christina, I imagine, you know, knowing you, you had the confidence to ask all of these questions. But I think you know sometimes for a listener, it can feel like very daunting, right? Like, am I burdening the the company? You know, they're the hot shot company. They're they're all over the news. But like, it's actually your right as an employee to ask these questions because it's your money right? and like you are about to give yes. you know, your prime time like to kind of you know ask all these questions max can send over like a list we also have like a template you can literally copy and paste it you can read it in whatever accent you think is most effective for negotiation um but th that's kind of one index here you know one vector yes. another vector 
and, and I just want to, I'm curious, like, cause I think you've been right a lot and now your job is professionally being right. Like for people who are not professional investors, how do you think about underwriting companies just in general mm. about where to work on? Because when you exercise your options, you're investing in a company. When you're joining a company or you're, you're investing in a company, are there any things you do? Maybe just one or two things that you look for in a company that in particular, like led you to actually join at the time, because Stripe back then, you know, wasn't Stripe as now, wasn't so obvious that it would be mm -hmm. such a bet. And a lot of people are probably in those positions today. Yeah, yeah. So I would say with the investor lens um, and also with the, you know, startup employee thinking about, you know, is this opportunity valuable uh, for me financially in the long term? I think I'm looking at it from the perspective of, of probably three different factors, uh, people, uh, market, and um, lastly, product. And I, I would say like product often, if you're joining very early stage companies, doesn't matter as much just because like it's very early. The product is, you know, not necessarily fully formed. So often I would say the most data that you have is really on the former two, which is like people and market. And so people is absolutely the most important for me. And I have always been extremely people driven whenever I've ever decided to join a company and it's generally worked out well for me. And I think there are a few factors here. Like one, is this like a high integrity group of people, right? Do I feel like this set of people who are running this company, primarily the founders, first and foremost, are going to have high integrity when they make decisions about the company, um, whether to take funding, how to spend money, et cetera, et cetera, because I want to make sure that we are running um, a very much above board company, especially these days when a lot of what you see in the news, people not running companies super well. Um, so firstly, that. Second, do I think that these people have... Um, the potential to make an outsized, um, have an outsized impact on a particular space um, or product area. And so, you know, for example, when I was looking at the opportunity to join Stripe, um, they were thinking about building a uh, product that was a developer focused payments product, which hadn't necessarily been built before. There were a lot of companies that uh, built payment products, certainly, but not necessarily a company that said, hey, we're going to look at the developer and build an experience that is critical to them because we think they're the decision maker in a lot of companies and will continue to be. And I felt like these were a set of people who actually could build really fantastic developer products and that they were particularly skilled at that um, and that their lens on this world of payments, which they actually knew nothing about prior to starting Stripe um, would be something that, you know, A, they could learn um, and, and B, come out, uh, like come at it with an outsider's perspective. So um, I think in terms of people, it was like incredibly smart, incredibly kind, high integrity um, and attacking a space that I felt that they could be um, uh, able to attack in a way that would be quite differentiated. And so that kind of gets me a little bit more into market um, as well, which is a second factor. And I think generally you want to join companies that are not building like, you know, small little things that like are kind of nice to haves or what we call investing vitamins. Um, you want to build products that are addressing a real pain point for a particular market that is large. Um, and generally you're either looking for a market that is already big payments was already big. Um, so Stripe, you know, tick that box, but payments was also growing really fast because more and more payments were coming online um, rather than offline with cash. And so I think the great thing about Stripe is that it picked a really fantastic market that was big and growing well, and then picked a particular constituent in that market being developers um, who were having an outsized say in what kind of products they could pick for their businesses. Um, and so those were the factors, I think, for me that really stood out about Stripe um, and stood out about Notion and a bunch of, a lot of, a lot of other companies that I've joined and invested in. And so I think the most important decision that you can make is like what company to join. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the other things, like what is your offer and everything else, those are the details. Um, and you can make a lot of really fantastic optimizations for yourself. Um, and, you know, the time to make them is, is certainly when you have an offer. Um, and so it's a very short window to make that decision. But, you know, picking the right company is, is first and foremost. Make, makes a ton of sense. I, you know, I, I think play it back a few things that stick out to me. One is I think most people aren't particularly good at underwriting companies. As I said before, it's, it's a hard thing to predict the future, but you've met, you know, you've only worked at so many companies, but you've met hundreds, thousands of people in your life. So if you can underwrite the people, right, and you can say, hey, I'm going to bet on this person to be successful, like, 
that perhaps is like a much more linear path. The second part of it is, you know, just in listening to Christina and, and others is, you know, notice how she's using words like incredibly smart or incredibly hardworking. It's not just enough often to kind of join a company where you feel like, oh, we're like a little good. Most startups fail. Most good startups fail. Like most great startups actually fail, right? Um, in order to be an outlier, you, you really have to believe in being incredible, right? Or insert adjective, you know, th that's great. So I think, you know, when you think about some of these things, it's not enough to, you know, for, for joining a startup, right? Now, there are plenty of other businesses where that's not needed. Um, but in this context, um, I think that can often shine through. And then finally, I think what Christina said is super true is, and this is what, one of the reasons I brought Christina, and if you look at her LinkedIn, she's been right often. Most people aren't right often, right? So picking the right company, or in a lot of cases, just picking the right people to join, like that has an outsize impact, right? Now, after you do that, though, it is your right obligation, responsibility, duty to get the most out of it, right? And that means getting the most out of it on all aspects, including the financial side. And some of the things that sometimes people don't quite grok or before it's too late are just some of the key terms that we've covered very quickly. But there's some more that I want to make sure that people are kind of aware of, you know, when they're first accepting an offer. One of those that I think is really, really pow powerful is this phrase called early exercising. Early exercising um, effectively means, and Max is going to walk you through a demo so you get an idea of like the impact of it, but early exercising basically is a, a clause that allows you as a shareholder or an option holder to purchase all of your options before they vest. All righty. Well, just Jordan's talking about early exercising. I can just bring it to life with a couple uh, simulations that basically show if you're an example, uh, you know, early stage employee, maybe you join like a series B company, you were granted 200,000 shares. And in this example, it's like one ISO grant um, and your strike price is about a dollar. And so what I'll just quickly do is talk through like some of the high level strategies between exercising later at an exit versus exercising as you vest versus maybe early exercising now. Um, so if we just click in real quick and each one be about 30 seconds. In this example, we're waiting to basically exercise until the liquidity event, the IPO, and then we're selling everything. Um, and we're modeling out just basic taxes based on, you know, this, this profile. Um, and in this case, there's, you know, all of the, all of the shares are being sold at short-term capital gains because it's not held for a year. Um, in the next example though, we're starting to show how the, uh, in this demo accounts, basically exercising a little bit each year. So a third each year. So in 2022, we're exercising a third, but you can see the exercise costs. Then in 2023, as the 409A starts to jump, right? The value internally for, for the employees to exercise their stock options starts to increase as the company raises additional rounds of financing. Now we're triggering AMT, which is that thing that Jordan talked about earlier in the presentation. So the cost exercise is the same, but there's additional tax costs. And then lastly, in this example, right, we're, we're exercising the rest, and then we're selling all of it at the IPO. In this case, you can see that some of the equity is qualifying for long-term capital gains. Some of it's still short-term capital gains. And therefore, the net outcome in this example is a little bit better, right? Instead of 2.7 million, it, you know, it's 3.4 million in this example. But the, the ultimate example of what Jordan's describing is early exercising. And you're basically saying, hey, I actually, before my equity vests, so when I issue, when I'm issued my stock, I can buy my equity before it vests over a four-year schedule. And in this example, you don't have to pay any additional taxes because the 409A equals the strike price. The $1 strike price equals the 409A. And then you hold on to it. It all qualifies for long-term capital gains. And as you can see here, this leads to the largest net outcome um, because everything's qualifying for long-term capital gains as well as uh, being able to exercise it and, and minimize your tax burden. So these are like real, you know, life demo examples of various strategies and um, of someone who's potentially joining like an early stage startup evaluating this opportunity. And we'll dive into some more, but I'll pass it back to Jordan. Uh, Max. I, I appreciate you walking through that, Max. And hopefully my sharing my screen doesn't break our Wi-Fi. But um, I, I think it is really clear that like some of these key clauses can make a really, really big difference, both when you're joining a company, but also when you're potentially leaving your startup. Um, and Christina, I mentioned that you've joined lots of startups. Um, 
you've also left them uh, at, you know, at some point. I'm not saying you are an expert at leaving companies, but I'm curious, you know, as you think about your career and taking charge of your career and thinking about, you know, you're at Stripe for many, many years. And, and I think nowadays people don't stay at startups for very long. Often they, they kind of bounce around and expect to, you know, get a higher salary every time they bounce around. I'm curious, like, how do you take a long-term view towards building companies, but also think about like when it may be time to seek something new and like how, how should someone kind of potentially process that? Yeah. I think when I was at Stripe, I very much looked at the opportunity and said, Hmm, like, is there another like amazing group of people who are building in such a, you know, game changing space um, as the team that I'm with right now. And for seven and a half years, the answer to that question was no. Um, so I stayed. Um, and I also personally had, uh, you know, a lot of really great roles that enabled me to continue learning and growing personally, in addition to obviously like growing my wealth and continue to invest my equity. <laughs> so um, all of those things I think were, were very helpful and reasons why I stayed. Um, of course, like there are always reasons why people leave companies. And um, at a certain point I said, huh, I had actually uh, invested in this company notion as an angel investor and um, said, you know, I really like spending time with these people. Maybe I should spend all of my time <laughs> with these people um, and join the company full time. And I think that when you leave a company, I think it's really important that you think about, you know, kind of putting a, uh, that last chapter to your experience and, and how important that is, whether it's like transitioning your work um, you know, transitioning people, your team, right? I think you still want this company to succeed, assuming that you like exercised your, your options, like you are like a part owner of this company and you leaving should not be a reason why that company fails. So you should want that company to continue to be successful after you leave. And um, additionally, you may want that company to potentially do something for you um, at some point in the future. And you being very nice on the way out and on an ongoing basis. Like I still refer people to Stripe for, to like hire to this day, right? Um, and and in, in that it's, you know, it's always a, a kind of mutual exchange. And so I think that in leaving a company, you may want them to do something such as uh, providing an extension for uh, exercising uh, your options. At a lot of companies, you have maybe 30 days, maybe 90 days to exercise your options. Um, but if you don't necessarily have the money to do that, um, asking a company, hey, could I get an extension? Or, hey, like any chance we can move to like 10 year option exercise windows? I think that would be helpful to me, but also to other people, right? And um, being able to have a good relationship with the founders and the rest of the team, um, I think ensure that some of these things on the way out that might seem like details, but are very important to you financially um, can actually get accomplished. And so, um, yeah, those are the things that I, I tend to, to think about, um, you know, but I think it's always a question of like, do I think the, the opportunity that I am leaving for is an opportunity I'm running to? And it's always a phrase that we kind of talked about when we were at Stripe. It's like, oh, are you like running from something? Um, are you running to something? And like when you decide to take a new opportunity and leave a company, even if they're doing well, you should be running to the next company. Um, and uh, I've definitely, you know, that way with with Notion and thought about it as like, I'm, I'm making another bet here. Um, and the potential payoff of that opportunity should be just as big, if not bigger than the opportunity I just had. Super, super helpful. And I think, you know, something I really admire in, in people we work with at Compound and, and just broadly is this kind of long-term perspective on things that I think Stripe is known for, for curating, but kind of also just in general, thinking about, you know, not just the short-term payout for something, right? We're not, you know, you're not necessarily hearing Christina, oh, I'm jumping out of a company because they offered me a $10,000 signing bonus. Well, you know, that <laughs> could be impactful on your life. You realize like where you work is going to impact a lot of your life and your habits and what you read and what you think about. So, um, that that stuff's really important. Now, I think that companies, you know, it turns out most founders are not as weird as me in that they don't read about finance and taxes all the time. So sometimes I'm, I'm not saying they're all evil, but sometimes they they put their employees in positions inadvertently or advertently that are just really tricky and really tough. And Christina hinted at one of them, 
One of them is this thing called the post-termination exercise window, which says that if you were to leave your company, either you know you were fired or you were to leave on your own terms, you may only have 30 or 90 days before your equity expires at the end of your post-termination exercise window, right? And I'm not to say that all founders who have this are malicious people, but there's a lot of nuance and there's tax implications and administrative burden, but it sucks at the end of the day. Uh, if you're an employee to be put in a position where you have 30 days where you have to spend potentially millions of dollars on the thing you worked for for many, many years, and now it will go to zero unless you do something about it, right? So there are tough situations that you may or may not find yourself in. Um, and you know it can really make a big, big difference um, on your long-term financial future. So we have a bunch of um, tools uh, that like help you model this out. Um, we'll follow up with like free access to it and whatnot. But at the end of the day, like the broad stages, the broad steps you should look at are um, effectively, first of all, what information do I need to know, right? Oftentimes people will jump to making a decision before having the data. So what are my tax implications? What are the financial implications? What percentage of my net worth am I investing in this thing? Why, you know, sometimes people feel like they have to exercise their options. You don't, right? It's it, you could invest in Apple. You could you could invest in the S and P five hundred, right? So it, you know you don't have to invest in your single source of income. It, it's not like a mandated law as part of getting options. In fact, the purpose of options is they give you the option, right, to purchase um, uh, uh, equity in your startup. So th those sort of tough situations are really hard. And what I'd encourage is just optimizing for learning at first. Whether you're going into kind of a, a job offer and you're trying to kind of learn the key terms or while you're at the company being an advocate for transparency, not just for yourself, but for every other shareholder at the company who may be confused um, about kind of where things lie overall. I want to make sure that we're answering any questions people have as well. Um, Max, please do surface any that makes sense to dive into. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I think it'd, it'd be very useful um, maybe maybe as a last a last step in this um, before uh, diving into any okay there's a few questions to dive into but before diving into that I you know I I think I, I certainly don't believe anyone knows the future so I won't ask you for that Christina but I'm curious you know as you think about investing your time and money it feels like people are like a big big part of of that I'm curious like are there any other heuristics you use kind of while at Stripe or even now more broadly that you know when you think about deciding to exercise an option or deciding to invest in a company and think about that in your broader kind of future, like what, what things do you think about when making those sorts of decisions as to where you want to allocate your time and also your money? Yeah. I mean, I definitely look at like growth rate and potential um, as, as factors. And so, you know, when I joined Stripe, I, like, I guess I would say the company had a much higher valuation. The valuation was about around $500 million. And when I joined, I knew that like the number of customers was pretty small. The, the, the amount of volume was like pretty small. Um, but you come in and I feel like there were a lot of things that we did in that time that like drastically expanded those numbers quite quickly. And so when you're there, like you get so much more information than even like I currently as an investor in companies get, right? You, like, I, I think about this all the time. Employees know far more information than any outside investor knows about a given company. And so, you know, like what customers you're closing, how those customers are doing, um, if they're deciding to spend more money um, with that particular business, right? And so often like you see the signs um, before a lot of other people do. And, um, understanding that growth rate and your metrics and hopefully like you join a company where that data is transparent um, and it's not something that is kept hidden because I think the best companies want to know uh, and want to share with their employees like how they're doing. Um, so understanding that growth rate and if you see that being like quite significant and what I mean by that is like, you know, in normal times that might be like a three X or something like that year over year for sufficiently larger business uh, in a year like this, maybe two X um, because uh, people aren't buying as much as they used to buy. Um, and so I, I think those are factors that I think about. And then, um, you know, second um, it's, it's really about where you see the long-term potential. And I think that's like, to your point earlier, like, should I be buying Apple stock? And I'm like, well, I think Apple has potentially reached 
you know, or it's much closer to reaching its potential than I think Stripe is, right? Um, and I think that there's far more opportunity there uh, that still exists. And so if I'm leaving a company, right, I'm saying, do I think this company has potential to continue growing at, at its previous growth rate without me and continuing to see um, uh, that be achieved? And so for me, I, I'm thinking about it as, you know, more of a current growth rate and the numbers I can see and the factors I can see while I'm there. And then also what is the potential when all that information goes away? Super helpful. I think almost to summarize, like the, one of the key insights here is, um, you know, when you're investing in the public markets or you're an investor, even broadly, you can kind of take a probabilistic view to things. In other words, you could think about it like, what is the probability that this company grows over X period of time? But what's interesting about working at a startup is that rather than looking at the probability, you can actually look at the conditional probability, which is that it's you plus the startup, right? That are that are kind of driving returns over the long term. And if you can look at it through a conditional probability, um, then you can actually make an impact on your long-term future wealth, right? And, and that's like a really cool feeling, right? If, if you mm -hmm. join a startup where you're able to bring your full self and you're able to bring your skills and your interests and your talents, all these different things, and you understand all the taxes, you never have to worry about that, um, then, you know, things can, mm -hmm. things can be great. Um, um, and yeah, I guess, Christina, I, I know you have to hop in a minute. We will answer any, um, any Q&A people have about super fun finance or tax law in a second. But Christina, anything else you want to share with folks? I know that you have a job board, of sorts that that people can mm. find opportunities where where can people find you or you know if you had any if you had a billboard to tell everyone with like what would <laughs> uh sure uh i guess i'm most active probably on twitter uh so twitter.com slash cjc that's my handle um but um yeah i guess i guess i would say like one last tip would be if you are thinking about joining a company um one like piece of material that I would ask for is their most recent board deck. Um, and I think that's useful on a few fronts, like do they actually have board meetings and run board meetings? Um, and what is the information associated with that? Um, and then two, um, you'll get to know all of the same types of data that an investor would get into that business and, and try to determine if, if that feels like a good opportunity for you. Um, so that, that would be a tip where I, I feel like you can better understand how a company runs and operates, um, and what its challenges are. Um, and I think the more that, you know, going in, whether it's good or bad, um, uh, and I've joined, I've joined companies without boards, right? Um, <laughs> so like, again, but it's like, it's, it's data that I know going in. And I think, I, I think the number one rule, when, whether it's equity, choosing companies, et cetera, is like, ideally, no surprises. Totally. And I think that's a really good way to end this is, and, and again, as a, hopefully a reminder, because it's easier said than done, but like, all of this is just data collection. People are often so quick to negotiate. They're so quick to say, I have to expose my options. But if you take a deep breath, which I'm often reminded to do, and you ask yourself like, okay, well, what other information is out there, right? Could I ask the CEO, what competitors are there? Could I ask the CEO, did any investors, you know, offer you and you said no to? Like all of this is just data, right? And, and there's a lot of acronyms out there in the finance tax world where you're like, you get the data and you're like, okay, this confuses me even more. Um, but <laughs> you, can, you can spend that energy up front again, hopefully 10, 15 minutes. It's not, we're not asking, you know, you're not doing decades of diligence. Um, it can make a really, really big difference towards your long-term outcome. So I want to make sure I answer um, any um, any questions here. One is uh, about this acronym called QSBS or the Qualified Small Business Stock Tax Exemption, QSBS. So now you can feel smart if you know it. Um, basically, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. If you're an investor or if you are an employee or a founder of, 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 of small businesses, including startups. Um, basically how it works is you can get up to $10 million in tax-free capital gains um, if your stock qualifies for QSBS. For it to qualify, it needs to fit under several stipulations, one of which is you need to acquire the stock directly when, it, when the company has less than $50 million in assets, so earlier stage startups. The second is that the, the company has to be a qualifying category. So for, in for instance, banking or like real estate are not qualifying categories. So you can take either a list of which categories qualify. There can sometimes be some gray area, but um, something to kind of look into. And then the third is that you need to hold on to the stock for at least five years. And if you do all of those things before you sell it, um, you get up to $10 million in tax-free capital gains. But the problem is that um, you have to actually own the shares for five years. So owning an option is not enough. You have to actually own the shares. So 
one question to think about when you're joining an early stage startup is are you know will the company likely be QSBS eligible? Because if it is, that can make a really big difference on your net returns, especially if you're an investor, but not as big of a difference as working at the best company in the history of the world, but still a very big difference on your bottom line. Something like you know 20% additional returns because you're not paying any taxes on the on the income. Um, beyond that, sometimes you may be in a position where you're not able to exercise, um, you know, you're not able to exercise your options your, yourself. So you're looking at an opportunity and you're looking at a big number. The number could be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Um, depending on the situation you're in, you know, in your, your piggy bank, you may not be able to afford spending, spending your own money or investing your own money. So you can look at financing options. And depending on the situation you're in, certain financing options may be more or less attractive. There's a whole spectrum of financing options from kind of recourse options, meaning if the company goes to zero, you have to pay back the full price out of your own kind of personal balance sheet um, to non-recourse options, like um, kind of more secured against the collateralized private stock, where if the company were to go to zero, you wouldn't owe any kind of out-of-pocket money. Um, there's a lot of different providers in the space kind of across this, the spectrum. Um, firms like ESO Fund, for instance, kind of live on the non-recourse side. On the recourse side, there's several different banks that may kind of lend you. We help you kind of with all the sort of stuff. There's even more acronyms and terms to kind of sift your way through. But if you're in a position where you're at a company, you have a post-termination exercise window that's really short. So you're like, hey, I don't want to work at this developer tool company anymore. I've been here for six years, but I don't want all of my equity to go to zero because I've worked so hard on it, but I haven't been able to afford to exercise. And now the four NNA has risen so much because I was so valuable. Um, and you have 30 days, definitely, you know, is a stressful position to be in. Your friends won't really, you know, feel that bad for you because you could make millions of dollars and the taxes are a hard thing to complain about, but I feel bad for you because it is a hard position to be in and would love to be helpful to you in those sort of circumstances.